here. Shout out to all of our visionaries that are watching online. Thank you all for joining us. You all, we are in week number three of a series that we have been calling. Put it on the screen for me. It is called Refresh. And what have we been doing with this series? We have been looking at refreshing, giving our, ourselves a new way of thinking, but also hitting the redo or the restart button on some of the spiritual disciplines that we have in our lives, okay? If you missed it at all, because at the beginning of the year, everybody in here made some type of New Year's resolution, or maybe you made some goal that you were going to have, and probably by Dr. King's birthday, you had already forgotten about that particular resolution, right? In many different areas. But, but So we're hitting the refresh button. We're saying to ourselves, it's October 1st today. We're not waiting all the way until January 1 to start with some of these goals. We are setting some, some things in place today. We're hitting the refresh button today. But we're also hitting the refresh because we're refreshing our thinking on certain things as it pertains to spiritual disciplines. So if you missed week one, if you missed any of, the, uh, of this at all and you're watching online, you just click right here. We'll have the other weeks right up there for you. But if you missed week one, we hit the refresh button on understanding reading scripture and how the important it is to read scripture faithfully and daily. Because when we read scripture, what happens is we renew our minds and we find out God's character and the word of God shows us how to live. Last week, if you missed it all, we hit the refresh button on our understanding about what the church is. And the church is not a religious institution. It's not just a place that we come and we give God praise. While that may be true, this really is an embassy because we are as followers of Jesus Christ. We are citizens of heaven, not of this earth. And so just like the U.S. has embassies all over the world, heaven has embassies all over the world as well. And this, the church, is heaven's embassy. The way heaven operates and lives, that's how we want to live and learn from this particular place. So if you missed that at all last week, you want to go back and watch those, those particular messages. Today, though, y'all, today, 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 today. We go, we go on to another spiritual discipline. But before I go and tell you what this one is, I first have to apologize to you as a church. I've got to apologize. As your pastor, I just want to take just a couple moments here to apologize about something. I'm apologizing for not actually teaching and actually preaching on today's topic more than I have. I think, I don't, I don't even think I've done a full message on this. I think I did like, half of a message on this like two years ago. And the reason I'm apologizing is because I, allowed, I have allowed fear to keep me from preaching this particular message. And the fear is, what are people going to think? What are they going to say? All of these things. But the reality is, if I don't preach the word of God, if I don't preach the whole truth to you and nothing but the truth, then I'm not actually helping you live the full life that God has for you. Amen. And so I want you all to know, I apologize for not teaching on this because this will be, for some, this ain't going to be nothing because you're already living it. For others, this may be a challenging message for us. And today we're going to be hitting the refresh button on the topic and the spiritual discipline of, put it on the screen for me, generosity. And specifically, financial giving to God through the local church. Now, here's the thing. I know somebody in here, this may be your first time at Kazon Church or your first time in a long time, and you're thinking to yourself right now, out of all the Sundays that I could have came to church, I came on the Sunday that the preacher is talking about money. I, should, I knew I shouldn't have came into church today. Listen, I understand. I get it. I get it, because let me, t let me be honest with y'all. This is not a message that I necessarily like teaching on, but I got to teach it. I have to teach this, because it's the truth. And those of you who've been here for a while, you will, you will admit, have I taught on this a whole lot? Do I spend a whole lot of time talking about how much that you need to be? I don't, I don't do that. We don't do that here. But this is in the word of God, and this is important to the life of a believer. So I just want you to know, if you're new with this today, or you've been, you haven't been in a while, stay with me here today, because my goal 
is to hit, whoa, hold up, there we go, Lord, there we go. My goal is to hit the refresh button and to give us a new way of thinking as it pertains to generosity. Because it's not just, this isn't something for just a few people. This is something that is for the life of every person who follows after Jesus Christ, okay? So just stick with me here today. I promise you, you won't leave here going, I knew I shouldn't have come. You'll leave here going, okay, now I understand a little bit better. So I want everybody to think back to your younger years and think about specifically when you were in high school. Think, think about when you were in high school, okay? Whatever high school you went to, every high school, whether you played sports or you didn't, every high school had a rival, a high school rival. You went to one school, and you just didn't like the students that went to that other school. You know, you know which one it is. Whatever school you may have gone to, if you played sports, you knew whenever you played against that school, it was on. It was a new heightened level of you just felt the tension. Maybe, maybe that's not your thing. Maybe if you, you watch professional sports or college sports, there's always a rivalry. In basketball for years, it was the Celtics versus the Lakers. And then more recently, it was the Warriors against the Cavs, right? In football, a big rivalry is like the Baltimore Ravens and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Whenever they face each other, they hitting, they hitting the other team a little bit harder than they hit some other teams because they just don't, they just butt heads. And the reason I bring all of this up about a rival is that so many times we often think that our battle as followers of Jesus is against God, it's God versus the devil, and that, it actually never says that in Scripture. It never says it's God versus the devil. Number one, the devil was created. He can't defeat God whatsoever. Can't happen, won't happen. But there is a specific rival that God points out in Scripture that he knew this would be the biggest rival to him in the life of every person. And ladies and gentlemen, that rival is money. There's actually a Scripture that says... In the New Testament, where Jesus says, he doesn't say you can't serve God and the devil. But the scripture actually says, you can't serve God and money. The chief rival to our hearts as followers of Jesus Christ is not the devil. I will lean in more to say it actually is money. It's money. Which is why in scripture, money is mentioned oh, almost 2,400 times in the entire Bible. That is more than prayer and faith combined. Because God knew that the greatest rival to him in our hearts was going to be money. So he, meant, he, he made sure that it was throughout the scripture that it talked about money. The Old Testament speaks about it. Jesus teaches on it. And then Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, even he talked about money. And let me tell you, if, you, if you're watching online, it has never been more quiet in church than when a pastor preaches on money. I can preach about anything else. I get a couple amen. When you're preaching about money, amen. the, the amens are, amen, pastor. It's okay. Stay with me. Stay with me here today. I want to show you what Jesus, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from the New Testament to the Old Testament, then I'm going to come back to the New Testament so that we can understand just a few things of what Scripture actually talks about when it pertains to generosity and giving and why this is important and the ways that we are supposed to give. Let me show you what Jesus actually says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, and it says this. Jesus said, give as freely as you have received. Now, let me ask you all something. I think we all can admit this. Everybody can admit this. There are things that you and I have that we know good and well. We didn't earn it, nor did we deserve it. Anybody? Am I the only one? There are, there are some blessings that you have in your life. You didn't deserve it, nor did you even earn it, right? Amen. Think about it. None of us earned the right to live. It was given to us. That's a gift, right? Some of the jobs that some of you have up in here, if you were honest, when you got hired, you were like, I don't know how they hired me. <laughs> Boy, I barely, <laughs> if they only knew what I didn't know. That's God. That's God freely giving to you a gift that you did not earn, nor did you really 
even deserve. But he said, I'm going to give you things throughout your life, family, friends, possessions, blessings that you didn't earn, but I'm going to give it to you. And as freely as you have received those things, because let me tell you something. I know very few people. You don't have a job and you were offered a job and it pays more than what you had before, which was if you didn't have a job, you probably had nothing. Right. Very few people are going to be like, no, nah, I don't want the job. Now, if you got options, that's different, right? You got some options. You may pick and choose like I want that job or that job. But so it says here, give as freely as you have received. Amen. I offer you a job. or I give you a gift. I, if I handed you $100 right now, very few of y'all would be like, y'all, y'all may go, you for real? But very few people are going to be like, nah, 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 I don't, I don't want that money. And I, no, take it. Okay. And what God is saying is freely as you as received it or you would receive something, give just as freely. Generosity is how we're supposed to live as followers of Christ. Here's another verse for you. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. And it says this, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, it is more blessed to give than to what? Receive. receive. <laughs> it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let me tell you something. I love getting gifts. You got a gift? I'm going to take it in a heartbeat. I love getting gifts. Love it. Especially them dollar bills, right? <laughs> Anybody got cash app and you hear that little cha-ching in your cash app and you look at your phone, somebody done bless you with a little bit of I love it. I love it. But don't get me wrong. I love even more being able to bless somebody else. Like there's a special feeling when somebody gives to me. I'm so thankful for it. But when I'm able to give to somebody else, yesterday was my, my, my daughter Willow's, uh, wasn't her birthday, but we celebrated her birthday. And the, all the gifts that she was getting, she was so excited. Oh, my gosh, I always wanted this. Oh, my gosh, yes, yes, yes. But when she gives gifts to her sister, she'll be standing over in the corner like, oh, I want you to open it up. Hurry up, open it up. Hurry up, come on, open up my gift. Because she wants to see the expression on her sister's face when she's able to give them that gift. There is something special about seeing somebody else's joy. And this is the life that we're supposed to live and have as followers of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be willing givers. Willing. This is supposed to be who we are and how we live. And specifically in the church, there are different ways that we, God, calls us to give financially. One of those is called an offering. Anybody ever heard an offering? An offering is something that you give and you give it freely and you're like, hey, I'm going to give something. I've got a dollar in my pocket. I'm going to give back to God through the church this dollar. And offerings are great. We're, so, we're called to give them. In the book of Deuteronomy 16, verse 17, it actually says, it talks about giving offerings, which are above the first way that God actually calls every single one of us to give as followers of Christ. And that is through the tithe. If you've never heard of the tithe, the tithe simply means this. Tithe means a tenth. That's what it means, a tenth. And God actually commanded this. Now, I'm not going to put all these scriptures. Uh, I'm not going to read you all of these, but I'm going to put them on the screen so everybody can see these. These are just a few of the scriptures in the Bible. I'm not going to put all 2,400 of them up there. <laughs> that would be way too much. But I'm going to put a few of them up here where you actually can see that God commands his people to tithe or give a tenth of what he gave to them. Leviticus 27, 30. you can actually take a uh, screenshot of this yourself if you want to look these up so you can see, okay, is this pastor lying to me or is this really the truth? Look it all up. These are all the scriptures that talk about where God commands us to give back to him a tenth of what he's given us. The job that you have was given to you. Yes, yes, uh, uh, that grocery store, or that school, or that medical facility may have hired you, but God was the one that opened the door for you to have that particular job, right? And so in their time, what God would give them typically were plants, crops, animals, and things like that. So God would say to them, give me the first tenth of what I've given to you. I provided the rain, you bring back, you just give to me the first tenth. That's what all of these particular uh, verses talk about. And by giving back to God 10% of what he had provided his people, this acknowledged to, in their hearts, God's lordship in their lives. 
This wasn't like, oh, I'm giving this to the pastor or things like that. This was, I'm giving to God because God has provided me everything that I have. So because God has given this to me, I'm giving back to him, not 100%. He's only asking and requiring of 10%. You do realize the government, United States government, wants about 30%. So God isn't even asking for the same amount as the government does, okay? He said, give back 10%. And this was a way they expressed gratitude and they demonstrated their faith in him. When they gave that tenth, they were saying, God, we but trust that you've given us the 100% and you're going to give us even more. So we're going to return to you the first 10% that is already yours. And so I'm going to jump to a verse uh, here in just a moment. When they did this, listen real quick. When they did this, they came under a covenant. A covenant is another word for a binding agreement. So we sign contracts. But a contract can be ripped up. A covenant in that time was basically if somebody made a covenant, you would cut yourself and you all would put your blood together, meaning we are now one. And so when, you, when they would return their tithe, they were saying, we are one with you, God, and we come under your covenant. And this practice wasn't just in the Old Testament. That's why I put this one here. And there's other verses I could have put because this practice continued in the New Testament because Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it. So, Because you'll hear some people go, tithing is an Old Testament thing. It was still happening in the New Testament. And technically, we are still living in the New Testament right now. Okay? And so it was continued. Why? Because Jesus continues what they call, in the book of Hebrews, it's called the priesthood of Melchizedek. I'm not going to preach on this very long, but I want you all to know what Melchizedek means. Melchizedek was a priest and a king in the book of Genesis. Before the law was ever written, before God said, give a tithe, Abraham, who was God's chosen, one of God's chosen people, gave to this king 10% of what God had blessed him with. So it says that Jesus actually continues that Melchizedek who received the tithe. So now let me take you to a verse of scripture that um, if you've been in church for a while, you've heard pastors preach on this. Many times. If you've never been in church, this may be new to you. But I'm going to show you a verse, and it's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Before this verse, God actually tells the people, because they were suffering, and they're like, God, why are we suffering? Why are we going through all of this? And he was like, well, I'm going to tell you one reason, because you've been cheating me and you've been robbing me. And they were like, robbing you? How can we rob God? We're people. How can we? He was like, because you haven't been returning the tithe to me. And then, so what he says is this. He comes here in Malachi 3, verse 10. Now, stay with me. Because I want us to refresh our thinking on the tithe. And I got some for you. It said, God told them this, bring all the tithe or bring the first 10% into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. And I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Amen. Try it. Put me to the test. Put me to the test. So this is God saying basically this. You don't believe me? You don't believe I'm a man of my word? Try it. Put me, try me. See what happens if you will honor me in the way that I've commanded you to honor me. Now, a lot of people will tell you growing up, I used to always hear this, don't you test God. Don't you test God, he gonna get you. But that ain't even in the Bible, because God right here says, test me. <laughs> Try me out. See if I'm a liar or not. And this is one of the ways. Think about this. This is how important it was to God. He said, I know that this is a rival for your heart. I know that this is going to be difficult for you. So because I know it's difficult, God says, test me. See what happens if you will do what I commanded you to do. He says, if you do, he will pour out a blessing so great that you won't even have room to take it in. Now, here's where I got to slow our roll, because some of us come from church traditions in which this was used. Let me keep it a buck with you as manipulation. This was used to make you feel bad for not giving. And then they tried to hit you with the bait and switch. If you give, God's going to bless you and he's going to give you all that money back. And it never actually says that here at all. It doesn't say that. What it says is, 
I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. We have taken that word blessing and we've been, we've, it, what we play, put in place of it is money. And that's not what that says. So I don't, I need you to hear me. I am not encouraging you and pointing you to scripture to give because I'm telling you, if you give to God, he going to give slide you some money. It's not what it says. First of all, some of you don't even give at all and God has given you money. So, so understand that. But what he's saying here is when you see that word blessing, here is what that word actually means. It means experiencing, enjoying, and extending the goodness of God in your life. That's not always money. Thank you for that one amen. It's cool. I'll take one, okay? This is not God promising earthly wealth because I need everybody to understand this big principle. God is not a slot machine. He's not the Ameristar, Hollywood Casino. Let me come to church real quick. God, I'm going to give you my tithe. Cha-ching! Bring me some money back to me, God. That's not how this works. But unfortunately, that's how some of us have been taught. Or we've been led to believe that God is this slot machine. He is not. He is the God of all. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And guess what? He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need it. So if anybody thinks, oh, he's telling me because God needs my money, he don't need it. He doesn't need it. This is the same God who when Jesus, they were like, Jesus, we got to give. Jesus picked up a fish opened the fish's mouth, and there was money inside of the fish. God can do that in a moment. So he doesn't need your money. What God wants from everybody is your heart, your trust, your faith that he is your provider. That's what this is all about. Because how many of y'all know that you can have money and not be blessed? There are millionaires and billionaires who, if you ask them, I'm not happy with my life. I got all the money in the world. And you can talk to people who are in, in just, just crazy poverty. I don't mean United States kind of poverty. Because United States poverty is you can still, homeless, you can get to a homeless shelter. I'm talking about those nations where they don't have homeless shelters. Those nations where they don't have anything, period. No opportunity, like uh, Davina and I, were, were, uh, she was watching something that was talking about in India, there is a caste system, which means you're born into that. If you are wealthy, you're at the top, you're always going to be at the top. If you're at the bottom, you will always be at the bottom. But then there are a group of people who are below the bottom called the untouchables in their particular culture. And these are people that even the folks at the bottom don't even want to be around. Right? And sometimes some of those people are some of the happiest people in the world, in the world. And they have nothing. So just because you have money doesn't mean that you are blessed. Because your wealth, it can help with joy, but it's not the source of your joy. I don't want to say it gives you no joy, because that would be a lie, because if any of us get a little bit of money, it's going to make us smile a little bit more, right? So I'm not going to act like it don't help. But it's not the source of our joy. Okay? God calls us to align ourselves with his kingdom agenda, his kingdom agenda. Now, I want to say this, too, because um, I've had a lot of people, and I'm not, some of you all are in this room, and I'm not looking at you and being like, you wrong, you shouldn't have said this, because it's not just been from you. I've had a lot of people, and what they'll come up to me and go, and they'll say, Pastor, as it pertains to the church, why don't you apply for, for, for federal grants and all of these different grants? And you can have, back in the day, you would have fish dinners or you would have uh, uh, bake-offs and things like that to raise money for the church. And I'm not against those things, okay? I'm not, against, I'm not saying that federal grants aren't wrong. Typically, federal grants don't apply to the church, typically. And I'm not against fish dinners either. If y'all having a fish fry, holler at your boy. I'll probably show up, especially if you got, we're we from St. Louis, the St. Louis area. If you're not from around here, this may not make a lot of sense to you because my wife didn't understand this when she first came up here. When I'm talking about, if you got a little fish dinner, fish fry, I'm talking about the St. Louis style, where you got some fish and you got to have 
some white bread with the pickle and the onions on the side. I don't know what that does. And then you also got to have a little bit of spaghetti with that thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? With some hot sauce. But your spaghetti can't, it's got to be right though. You know, some of y'all spaghetti, it just ain't quite, it ain't quite, it's just missing something. I don't know what it is. I'll show up, got nothing against it. Love a fish dinner. But the primary way in the kingdom of God of financing his kingdom and his church is not through federal grants and not through fish dinners. First, it is the people of God returning back to God the first tenth and then giving offerings which is above that. That is the primary way that the kingdom of God is funded. Now, can there be grants? Yes, but that's not first. If we aren't first doing what he commanded us to do, then we are out of order and we want to get in a line. Because in Jesus Christ, every single one of you that have given your life to Jesus, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. So this is not saying, oh, because you don't give, God's not going to bless you. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is when you are in line with God's kingdom agenda, there are more blessings that come along with that. OK, so please understand me with this. OK, now, this isn't about giving to the church as well. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. This is all about giving to God. So what do I mean by the tithe? Let me help some of us here. Let me put some math on the screen so we can understand what does that mean? Does that mean, OK, I'm, I'm tithing if if I just give ten dollars or twenty dollars? Excuse me. This is what it means. These are practical mathematical equations. OK. What that means is if you work a job or you work something and you are paid $100 for that month, right, or that pay period, you multiply that times 0 0.10 or 10%, and what does that come to? $10. So if you are paid for a job, $100, God says return to me 10. Not 100, 10%. If you made $1,000, Multiply that by 0.10. Yeah. You give back to God $100. I stopped at 2500 because I could have kept going and all of this stuff. All you have to do is whatever your income is, multiply that by 0 0.10, and you're going to get what a tithe is. Okay? That's what this is. Now, some people will be like, okay, Pat, they, they try to, we, we, we try to um, uh, figure this all out. Okay, is that on my gross or on my net? You know, because, you know, it ain't, I get paid, you know, 50 grand a year, but I only get about 38 of that. You know what I'm saying? So which one? Here's what I will say. This is all about your heart. I'm not going to come in here and be like, if you're not giving from that gross or you're not giving from that net, this is all about your heart. But here's what I would say that I personally, what I do in my family, we do, we give off of the gross because we say what goes to God is first. Because the government, they going to get theirs. Social Security, FICA, all of this other stuff. They getting theirs. So I want to make sure that God gets his before they get all of theirs. So that's what I say, personally. Does the Bible say grosser or, or, or net? No, because those words weren't in Scripture at the time. And that, that's more of a, of a, of a modern-day thing. So, and I'm going to show you in Scripture as well here in the New Testament, what do I mean by... Uh, you got to decide in your heart. So stick with me, okay? So tithing, this is the way that a follower of Christ is supposed to live. Now, I also understand that for some of you, when you saw this, you're looking at how much you make in a month, and you're like, ooh, you sure about that, Pastor? Like, that's, that's kind of tough, man. You got you to understand, I got bills, bills, mobiles, and mobiles. I got kids. I have a, I have a pet. I got a car note. I got all, and trust me, I understand. This is a sacrifice. I need everybody to understand this. I'm not going to come up here and be like, it's not a sacrifice. It is. Can I tell you a story about me and my wife? When we first got married, we were broke. Let me, no, let me rephrase that. We were broken and broke. Because <laughs> we went to a Christian university which means we had tons of student loans, and then we both got jobs in the education field in the state of Oklahoma, which if you don't know, 
about teacher pay, Oklahoma, there's 50 states. Oklahoma's not number 50, but it's not higher than 47. <laughs> so we weren't getting paid very much at all. And we had student loans. And I remember we, had, we, were, we were tithing at first when we got married, and we were like, yo, this is, this is tough. And I remember coming home, uh, visiting. No, I don't think I came back here. I asked my dad. No, we were, no, I'm sorry. We were here in St. Louis visiting, and I asked my father, who was the pastor of this church at that time. I said, Dad, it's getting hard. I'm not going to lie. I know we're supposed to tithe. I know this is what you raised me on. But this is difficult. Like, you don't understand. We broke. We didn't even have any kids yet. We were like, we... We are struggling. So my dad said, why don't you test God? I was like, what? He's like, the scriptures say test him. And I was like, you for real? He's like, yeah. Don't give. Take the next year. Don't give your tithe. Don't return the tithe for six months. See what happens. Then return the tithe for six months. See what happens. So we said, bet. We were like, great. That's... <laughs> That's a little bit we get to keep, you know, to pay off some other bills and things like that. For, so for six months, we did not tithe. We did not return the tithe. Now, did we still give? Yeah, we gave $10 here, $25, and we would give a little bit, but we were not tithing off what we brought in. And can I keep it a buck with you all? For six months, every single month, we were in the red. We had less money than we had than we were actually tithing. And I was like... How is this possible? How are we in the red? So like we, when I say in the red, like we eating rice and eggs. This is back before eggs like went way up, you know what I'm saying? We was eating <laughs> rice, eggs, and noodles, and spinach, spinach leaves, goulash. That's what, that's what my wife was making every, I'm not lying to you. If she was here, she would be like, that's what we did every day because we just did not have, we were always in the red. So for those six months, we were like, well, we tried it. Now let's go back. Every single, the very next month, we were in the black again. Now, it wasn't a lot. It wasn't like we went from being in the red, now we balling with over $1,000 in our savings account. But it was like, okay, Lord, how is there $100 left over this month and it wasn't last month? And we actually gave more. How is this possible? Because God's word is true. He said, test me. And we actually did. Now, again, did he just bless us financially? He did a little bit. We didn't go from nothing to balling. We didn't go from that, but we had a little bit left over. No, more than that, though, in, in our entire marriage, there has been peace in our home. Now, does that mean we don't argue? No, we, we are we a married couple. Life happens. We have disagreements. We have arguments. But uh, for the whole part of our marriage, that we've had peace in our home. We have seen peace in the lives of our children. We've even seen that peace extend to even our church, which I'm going to talk about here in just a few minutes as well. But I'm here to tell you, this is something that I'm not preaching, something that I have not lived out in my own life. We still tithe to this day, right here. We give because we tried it, and it was not working. Because here's what I need everybody to know. God can do more with the 90% after you give the tithe than you can with 100%. Amen. Amen. He can do much more if you will trust him. Amen. But it's a step of trust. Now, I looked up something because uh, 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 I started, I was like, okay, Lord, what, what keeps people from giving in church? Because I really wanted to know. Like, what is it? People who come to church, whether they come every week or they come every now and then, what keeps people from giving to church? So I'm not going to put these on the screen, but I am going to read you some of this. This is the, the 10 reasons church members don't give, and this is from uh, John Wisniewski. Shout out to Pastor David Hawkins. He actually uh, gave me this particular uh, data. Here's what it says. Here's, here's the top, the 10 reasons why people don't give. Number one, they don't believe. They don't believe. Uh, Markel, you can just put it on the refresh screen for this one. They don't believe. What do I mean by that? They just don't believe in Jesus yet. They haven't taken that step to, tr to, I don't, to trust God. I'm kind of figuring this out. Do I believe? Do I not believe? So they're not in the system of believing in God. Number two, they don't know why they should give, which is why I'm teaching this message. Maybe some of you all just didn't know. Oh, I mean, I give a little something every now, but I didn't know. 
You just didn't know. You weren't taught it. Maybe you didn't grow up in church. You didn't know these things. So that's number two. Number three, they're in a transition. Maybe that's you. You're in a, some type of a transition. You just moved to a new city. And so no, you no longer have a church home or you're, you're going through a tra- another transition is you just recently gave your life to Jesus. So you're figuring this whole Jesus thing out. Number four, you're in a difficult financial season or situation, right? You just lost your job. You lost a loved one, right? Money is inflation. Let's just call it what it is. Money is funny. And so people are like, okay, I can't give because I'm in a difficult situation in a difficult season. Number five, they don't know how to give at the local church. They don't know how. Well, at Kazone Church, there's a few ways that you can give. Let me help you on how you can give. Number one, if you're in person, in the seat back in front of you, there's an offering envelope right there. That's one way that you can give. In the back of this church, we don't pass the plate here at, at Kazone, you know, because we, we launched Kazone during COVID. So I was like, how can we not have people do all of that? So we put an offering box at the back of the auditorium. So that's actually where you can give. You can also give online. Let me just show them where, it is, where it's at, Markel. You can go to kazone.church slash give, and you can give online. So if you don't have cash, you can use car. There are some ways that you can give at Kazone Church as well. So most people, some people, they don't know how to give. I just showed you how. Okay, let's go to the next screen. You can go back to the refresh screen there. Um, number, number six, they don't know where their money goes when they give it to the church. Is it going to the pastor for him to get a brand new Escalade? It, it, uh, is the, uh, how to, because usually it's always centered around the pastor. What is he? I ain't giving the money because I don't know what the pastor going to do with it. Well, here's where we're at his own. We are humble and we are honest. We are a transparent church. Let me show you where your money goes at his own church. Let's put it on the screen so everybody can see it. This was all agreed upon, not by Pastor Will Coleman, but by our church council, our board of directors here at the church, which is a group of uh, five other people outside of myself that decided when money is given at the church, when people return the tithe and they give offerings at his own church, here's where it goes. 40% of it goes to administrative costs. What does that mean? That could be uh, salaries. That could be uh, uh, just paying for different insurance for the church and different things like that, okay? So that's 40%. 15% goes to ministries. Z Kids, wildlife, guest experience. You do realize when you come up in the church that coffee and tea that you're drinking ain't free. <laughs> Got to pay for it. Amen. So guest experience gets, those ministries get 15% of what you give, right. okay? Our kids, listen to that, listen. There's no crying babies. You're not grabbing your kid right now to tell them to sit down. They're over in Z Kids. 15% make sure that your kids can get, can, they can experience Jesus. They can believe, love, and live Jesus on their own level. Yeah. Okay? 15% goes to building expenses. You, you, you all want to sweat every Sunday? <laughs> you, we need air. You want to be able to see? We need lights. Right? We just purchased the building next door. Now, some of y'all are like, can you turn down the air, Pastor? It's kind of cold up in here. Some, but then there's some folks that's like too hot up in here. I can't please everybody. I'm trying my best, y'all. I'm trying to find a good middle ground. Okay? We're trying. But building expenses, keeping the lights on. Something breaks. We have to fix it. You know, uh, the, the parking lot. Something happens in the parking lot. We got to do all of that. We got to pay for the building next door. Right? 10% of it goes to savings. We save it because we never know what could happen. We got our roof fixed a month ago, and it rained really bad. I forgot what day that was, and it leaked in here again. So now we need it saving so that we can actually make sure that we can pay for that. Another 10% goes to missions. That's missions are how can we help other pastors, other churches, other missionary organizations, and even help those in need at the church. Benevolence. And then 10%, guess what we do as a church? We tithe as a church. We return to uh, uh, 10%. We give 10% away because I can't tell you all to do something that we're not doing as a church. So you want to know where the money goes? If you want to take a screenshot, go right ahead. We humble and we honest here. Okay? So that you, you, people don't give because they don't know where the money goes. Just told you. Also, Amen. let me keep, you can keep this up here. As, uh, now go to the next screen. You, you have plenty of time to take a picture of it. 
Um, let me go to the, the, the next view. Uh, where am I at here? Okay, number seven. They, you don't understand how administrative costs can advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me help you all understand. What, what does that mean? Is that the gospel is free. Salvation is free. But it takes money to get the good news of Jesus to other people. Amen. And everybody understand that? Come on. Like, we could meet in a park, but after so long, we're going to have to pay to meet in the park. Right? We could meet at a hotel. They're going to say, okay, you want to use this room? You're going to have to start paying. We can meet in a public school, but they're going to say, you got to pay to be in here. And so just to get the good news out, just to have church, just to tell other people about Jesus, whether that's online, all these different things, there are finances that need to go into that so that we can get the good news out. Also, when it talked about like administrative costs, what does that mean? To be able to, as the church do you realize, so right now, I am the only full-time person at the church. We have a few people that are part-time, very small stipends that they receive, okay? And I'm not balling either, so I need everybody to understand this real quick. I drive a 2008 Kia Sorento that I got to take to the shop tomorrow because my air don't work, okay? So I, I just want to make that clear because I know some of us come from places where it's like, what is the pastor doing with this money? I ain't about the money. I'm not about it. But I'm the only person that works for the church full time, which means I'm the only person that my nine to five is thinking about how we can do. We can serve you all. We can serve this community. Do you know how much more we could do if I could hire other people as full time staff? Because everybody else works a full time job. And then they come in and they, they fit into their schedule what they can do for the church. But if we can hire a few more people full time on staff, do you realize we go from one person focusing on the church? Because there are certain things I know you all would love for us to do at the church. We can't do it. I'm the only one that has time to put effort and energy into it. And I'm doing a, a bunch of other things as well, right? But if we can hire people on full time. That means that now, those things that I'm doing, I can give to others. They can have a full-time job working in ministry, and we can actually reach more people. Do you know that these larger churches have full staffs and things like that? And they're able to actually do more because they, they understand the administrative costs that go into it. Y'all, listen, I am tired of us worshiping on video. I want to have a worship pastor here. But guess what? Can't do it. Can't pay them. Can I keep it a buck? Musicians and singers, that's a specific skill set that they want to get paid for. Yeah. Guess what? If we, if y'all were cool with me making a joyful noise, I would lead worship every single Sunday. But y'all don't want a joyful noise. Y'all want somebody that can actually sing <laughs> up here. If you didn't mind a little bit of Hallelujah, <laughs> salvation. If y'all didn't mind that, I would be up here every Sunday. I'll have y'all up here every Sunday. But that ain't how we do it. And so I'm telling you these things not to make anybody feel bad, but I need you to understand the administrative costs that go along with a church. Because a lot of people don't, they just don't know. We can reach many more people if we have more people in place. So that's just a few things. Let me let, get to these last few. So what? They don't believe. They don't know why they should give. You're in a transition. You're in a difficult financial season. They don't know how to give. They don't know where the money goes. They don't understand administrative costs. Which, let me just, let me paint you a picture of what I see. Because it's not just hiring more people on staff, but it's also the vision that I see for this church. When you all drive up here, Jenna Station Road in West Florissant, I see this being Kazone Corner right here. We just bought the doctor's office next door, right? And we're praying about what we're going to do with that particular facility, right? But I see this being able to open up, other, help other people, entrepreneurs open up businesses here in this area. I see us being able to purchase the homes that are right behind this street, renovating them to provide affordable housing for people. I see us, when you drive through this community, there's very little that is... It's beautiful. You go to other parts of town, you're like, man, it's so nice. I don't hear people say that when they come roll through Jennings. They're like, oh, you live in Jennings? Your church in Jennings? Okay, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you're not from here, just Google it, you'll, you'll, you'll figure it all out. But I see us making this area beautiful, that this is a place that people want to come to. There's, there's no indoor park. So, so in the, y'all know it gets cold here in the summertime, right? I mean, in, the, in, the, in the winter. Kids can't go outside. What if we could offer as a church an indoor park for the community? These are just some of the things that I see. What if we had opportunities for people to, to gather together and have fun and have recreation in the community? That's something that the church can provide. Do you realize that 90% of murder victims and uh, perp- uh, perpetrators are young men, specifically young black men in this community? I want to be able to minister to those young men so we can get them before they commit these crimes. And these are just some of the things that I'm seeing that are the vision for this particular church. There's different programs that I think that we can offer. There are so many programs for single mothers, but very few for single fathers. What if the church could offer that? What if we could do that? Those are just a few things that I see. But guess what? It takes money to be able to do those things. Last couple things. People have too much debt. I get it. Maybe you went to school like I did, and it cost a whole lot of money. So you're like, Pastor, I don't know how to do this. Number nine, they're not involved in church. People don't give because they're just not involved. You just come and then you leave, right? But we're called to be involved. If you are being blessed by what's happening here, we're supposed to give. Some of you all, that, how many of you all were here before 2021? Raise your hand. Very few. So you all remember how this place looked before, right? Do you realize every single renovation, and now those of you who've recently come, this is not how this church looked two years ago. Did not. Okay? But can I be honest with you? And I'm almost done. Can I be honest? Oh, he don't want me to be honest? Okay, I'll tell you. Let me me tell a lie then. No, I'm not going to lie in church. Every renovation that you see here at this church was because of the generosity of people that do not go to this church. Every one of them. There are people who have never stepped foot at Kazone Church that over the last few years they've said, we believe in what God is doing and going to do at that church. We believe in it. We believe in it so much, we're going to give. How much do you all need? And they gave to us. And so we are sitting in the overflow of other people's generosity. And they don't walk in here and get to sit in these seats, get to use these restrooms, get to drink this tea and this coffee, whose their kids aren't here getting to experience Jesus in a whole new level, but yet they still have given. How much more should we, those of us, that we get to be here? And guess what? Every single one of us, we're preparing We should be giving so that we can, because guess what? Not all of us are going to be here in 100 years. I want this church to be set up for our children, our children's children, and other people in this community 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now, but that starts with us today giving. And the last part, people don't read, the reason people don't give, because they don't trust the church leadership. I just told you what kind of car I drive. I showed you all of our finances. I'm not, let me tell you something. If I was all about the money, this guy right here would not be pastoring this church if I was all about the money. I would go to some either bigger church, I would be in a whole different field where I can make a whole lot of money and not have to worry about people wondering how I make so much money. (laughs) Because this is the only profession, I'm just just being honest, I'm going to move on because this is about y'all and Jesus, not about me. But this is the only profession that people have a problem with how much somebody makes. It's the only one. We ain't got no problem with NBA players making $50 million a year. But if the pastor makes $50,000, we like, where'd he get all that from? <laughs> Don't make sense to me. Let me move on. Let me move on. Last couple of scriptures that I want to show you, and then I want to I get this out of here. I'm going to go through these quickly. Because I need everybody to understand something about this. Because I, I showed you Old Testament, and now let me show you New Testament really, really quickly. Because I'm here, here to tell you, this is not about manipulation. But what you need to understand is that we think, oftentimes, here's what we think. We think that I'll give more when I have more. But that is not at all what Scripture teaches. Amen. Here is 2 Corinthians, this is, this, is, this is the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. 
Let's see what it says. It says this. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will, only, will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So here's what we have to understand. God doesn't bless you with more when you give, get, get more. What he says is when you give more, I can get to you more. When you give a little, I can give you a little. So the level of your generosity is determined by your level of generosity. The more you give, the more God says, I can give to them. The less you give, the less you the less. That's really what, that is a kingdom principle. Here's the next one. Here's why there's the scripture that I wanted everybody to see. Because I, I don't want people going, well, I guess I got to go ahead and give the tithe. I mean, I don't even want to give the tithe anyway. I don't want to give a dollar. That's cool. Let me show you this next verse. Show them verse number seven. You must each decide in your own, in your heart, how much to give. This ain't about me. I can preach to you give tithe. But you got to decide in your own heart how much to give. And here's the next part. And don't give reluctantly. Don't give like, oh, here, take my tithe. We don't want it. Keep your stinking dollars. <laughs> if you don't want to give, I don't. I don't want it. God doesn't want it, and neither do I. Because look around. If you don't give, God is going to provide. This is his church. The church is called the Bride of Christ. And Jesus is a very good husband to his bride. You look around, he has provided for this church. If you don't want to give, that's on you. Amen. God will provide. Right. So don't give reluctantly or don't give in response to pressure. This is not one of those churches where I look at the ushers and go, lock the doors. <laughs> they ain't leaving till we meet budget for the month. <laughs> I'm not doing that here. We're not doing that here. Because the scripture tells us, don't give in response to pressure. I'm not also, here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to have second, third, fourth, and fifth offerings. Oh, we didn't get enough. I need a $1,000 line right here. I need a $100 line right here. And you broke folks over here. Here's your line over here. We're not doing that at his own church. Because you're not supposed to give in, in response to pressure. I'm not going to look in the crowd and go, Marquitra, where your tithe's been at all month? That ain't how we do things here. Amen. Okay. That's ridiculous, and that's manipulation. Here's why. Because God loves a person who gives cheerfully. You want to give? Give. You don't want to give? He ain't looking at you. Fine. But when you give, give with a cheerful heart. I'm giving back to God. I'm returning the tithe, God, because you provided for me. Last few scriptures, and then we're getting out of it. Show them the next one. And when you do this, when you give cheerfully, not out of response to pressure, not reluctantly. God will generously provide all that you need. Not some, but all that you need. You need some peace. A lot of it is tied to your heart and your mindset towards generosity. Yeah. You need some joy. It's tied to your heart and your mindset on generosity. And then what, here's what happens. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. This is a promise, not a suggestion. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Amen. And last verse. Do I have one more? For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer. Remember, we talked about it. you give a little, you get a little. You give a lot, you get, he gets a lot. God said, I'm going to provide for you. And in the same way, I will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. This is what God is saying in you, what he wants to do in you. Now, here's what I need you all to understand. God says, don't, don't leave this place saying you were forced to give at Kazon Church. And also, don't leave this place saying that you had to give. You don't want to? I'm cool. God, we're going to make it. We're going to trust God. But here's what I want you to know. I know for many of us, it's a risk. This seems risky. This is like, I want to do this, but I don't know about this. I don't know about this. It's a whole lot. Like, I got bit. Well, God says, test me. Test me. Here's what I need everybody to know. If you don't give it his own church, I will still be your pastor. I will still love you. 
you want to get married and want me to officiate your wedding, I will still officiate your wedding. I'm not going to look at you and go, oh, here they go the non tither Because <laughs> this isn't about me. And this is not what I want from you. This is what God wants for you. He said, I will provide. I will bless you. I will give you more than you could, than you could ever imagine. If you will honor me in this, because you thought this whole message was about giving. But this whole message is actually all about surrender. It's about surrender. I'm kind of skipping ahead. Oh, no, no, no. This is showing the next scripture, and then I'm done. I'm going to show you two more scriptures. Jesus replied, said, you must love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, and all your heart your mind. Money is the greatest rival to our hearts and our minds. And God said, if you will give me your all, I will go so much far beyond what you could ever give. And here's what you need to know about when it comes to money. Show them the very next verse. Wherever your treasure is, the the desire of your heart will also be. I know what really matters to you if I looked at your bank account. I know, because that's where you put the majority of your money at. Those are the things that matter to you. If I looked and I saw what you gave, I would see whether or not where your heart is at. And it's not about me seeing your heart, but it is about you surrendering your heart to God. This isn't about giving. This is about God. Do you trust Do you trust God or not? Here's one thing I have for you. Here's a promise. When you give, show them the next verse. Okay, guys, this is it. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. It'll be pressed down. It'll be shaken together to make room for more running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount that you give back. So here's my challenge for every person here. I'm going to pray and dismiss us. Here's my challenge. This is called the tithe challenge. That you are going to set a goal today because we're hitting the refresh button. We're not looking at tithing and giving to God the old way. We're looking at it with a new heart, with a new mind. And here's what we're saying. We're going to set a goal today that 2024 will be your most generous year yet. Now, it's October 1st. So we're not waiting until January to be generous. But here's my challenge to you is that you set a goal, set a goal. We got October, we have November, we have December, then we have January. So let me hit y'all real quick. Those of you that are already tithing, set a goal. How can I get to a place where I'm giving above the tithe, where I'm giving off? And you don't go, I'm going to wait till January. You start in October. Okay, we tithe. Let's say you made $1,000 a month. We tithe $100. But in the month of October, we're going to give $105. And then November, we're going to give $110. And then 100, and in December, we're going to give $115. So that by January 2021, you already have the momentum of the goal that you set. If you're giving, but you're not yet tithing, I know 10% can seem like a whole lot. So here's what you do. Start in a little increment. Month of October, I'm going to get 5%, return 5% back to God. In November, we're going to take it up to 7%. In December, we take it up to 8%. And in January, we start off 2024, I'm tithing. I'm a tither. Set a goal. Don't make the goal a year, two, three, four, five years down the line. Set a goal that's in the near future that you can start moving towards. If you're not giving at all, period, set a goal that this month I'm going to give something. I'm going to work my way up so that in the the year of 2024, I become a tither. Because this isn't what God wants from you. It's what he wants for you. Because here's the thing, nobody in here can outgive God. You can't. You can't give him more than he's already given you. But I can tell you one thing, he wants to get more to you. That's financial, 
that's emotional, that's relational, that's for this community. God wants to get so much more to you, but it starts with your heart towards him. So let's pray and let's get out of here. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. God, we surrender to you. I know this was a message that I didn't necessarily want to even preach or teach about. But God, this is something that your word says and it's something that you want for them. And I don't want to hold anything back from the people getting what you have for them. So I pray that today that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, that we would take steps to trust you in the area of our finances. I know it's going to be a risk, Lord, but every day we take risks by getting into vehicles and we don't know what's on the other side of us getting in the car. So I pray that, God, that we begin to take a risk with you in the area of our finances. And that, God, when they take this step, that they will see your faithfulness to your word. That when they give, that you will give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, running over in their life, and that you will bless them all the more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. As we keep praying, every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to know that the, the most generous per person of all time was Jesus Christ. He left heaven, and he didn't have to, but he willingly sacrificed his life for yours and for mine. He said, I'm going to become your sin, and I'm going to die the death that every single one of you should have died. But you're not going to have to, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for you. He was beaten, he was bruised, he, was, he hung on a cross. He died, was placed in a tomb, and three days later, he rose from the grave. And scripture tells us this, that now anybody that calls on his name and that says that Jesus is Lord will be saved. Today, maybe you're here. And I know I talked about money and things like that, but this is more about your heart and you surrendering to God. And if you're here today and you want your sins to be forgiven, you want your past wiped clean, and you want to be made into a new person. Today's the day to give your life to Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, lift up your hand long enough for me to see you. Is there anybody that would say, Jesus, today I'm going to give you my life. You gave me yours, so I'm going to give my life to you in the way that I live. Well, there may be none here, but there may be somebody watching online today. Today's the day for salvation for you. So we at Kazone Church are going to pray with you together. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. And Jesus is Lord. Jesus, fill my heart. Teach me, Lord, to love others the way that you love me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's celebrate today, Kazone Church.